I am um, Dr. Shumaila Roos. I am working as a consultant neuroradiologist at Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center. Um, just a brief introduction of me is that uh, I did my FCPS in 2010 and uh, I did my fellowship in neuroimaging from Aachen University Hospital in 2013. And since then, I'm uh, working dedicatedly at JPMC, mainly in the MR section, and I'm uh, reporting all the uh, brain MRI here. Um, just to add more to your information is that uh, we are having uh, three scanners in our center. All of the three are 1.5 test and we are performing almost 200 scans per day. So it's a very busy hospital. We are seeing a lot of pathologies. Um, fortunate for us, unfortunate for patients, but uh, we prefer that we share a lot of knowledge with others because there are so many things which we are seeing and they are, you know, new to the rest of the world because the people who present here are having very unique kind of pathologies. So uh, I'll start this. this uh, I would like to thank uh, the society, first of all, for adding me to their faculty. I'm really grateful. It's an honor to be part of all of you. Um, when I was discussing with Dr. Athar, I just wanted to, you know, I had been attending the previous lectures and I could see that uh, there is uh, some reinforcement to the basics which is required. And I think it should be uh, done in every lecture because since we are seeing as radiologists the scans and routine, not everybody else, especially the people in neurosurgery and neurology, at times they are so busy, especially in our center, that they don't get uh, too much time to go into the depths of scan and uh, they just rely on our report. So being on the floors, it is better that all of you should have a basic idea and orientation of uh, different images so that you are, uh, you are the people who are actually interacting with patients and having a better idea of imaging modalities is going to help the patient. Uh, patients more and it is it will definitely improve patient care. I have no financial disclosures and no conflict of interest. My basic topic is uh, uh, to recognize the basic sequences. I'm sure you uh, most of you would be uh, familiar with that but even if there is a single person in my audience uh, who is not able to uh, you know pick up sequences then I, I will uh, there's no use of going ahead so I will just reinforce the basic thing so that uh, all of you should have an idea not only about the basic sequences, but also an idea that MRI is a tailor-made study. So if the clinical request is, is targeted, we are going to perform certain sequences which can help the clinician in making a diagnosis. Every sequence is the result of a unique acquisition and it takes patient time, it takes the table time, it takes, uh, you know, you are, you are giving appointments to the patient. Uh, at one at the stake of another, especially in our center, when we are giving appointments, there are so many patients that at times we have, right now we have an appointment which is, uh, appointment list which is heading in uh, June 2022. So we have appointments for another three to four months. Uh, it's such a busy place. So whenever we are scanning a patient, we are buying the table time and the patient time both. Uh, and we are giving appointment to one patient. So the clinical question should be very justified. And we should perform every sequence uh, in a unique uh, clinical, uh, unique image acquisition. Um, remember that, like in CT, there are no reconstructions. Uh, every sequence buys some time. For example, you are performing a sagittal uh, image, so it will require uh, extra three to four minutes. If you want an axial plane, you require another three to four minutes. So that is why uh, we should order sequences in a very specific way, so that we are not only uh, you know, uh, exhausting our machines. We are not exhausting our patients who are lying in the machine for an extra time. Because in MR, the patient is supposed to be very cooperative. So if we are exhausting our patients, we are, you know, exhausting our patient and the patient will not be able to lie still and the images will be degraded. And there will be a lot of uh, artifacts which will uh, hamper our uh, reading of scans. And every sequence should be done for a reason. So please do share the reason, especially as clinician on your request slip so that the targeted approach is used to read the images every time. So first of all, to start with the basic, I just want uh, all of you to have When I started working in radiology in my initial days, I remember that I was unable to differentiate even a CT from an MR because I used to find uh, this scalp fat as uh, the bony tissue. So for all of you who are very beginners, first of all, you should have an idea that what is the difference between a CT and MR. So in CT, the soft tissue differentiation is not very clear. You cannot uh, differentiate very clearly between uh, gray and white matter, and there is this uh, bony vault outside. But in MR, on T1-weighted images, this hyper-intense 
uh, signal is basically from the fat and the area internal to this, which is hypo intense is basically the uh, cortical bone and then there is gray and white matter. So the basic sequences which we perform are T1, T2 and flare, which are done in almost every scanner, even if it is a 0.3 Tesla scanner. So the sequences uh, which we perform in uh, neuroimaging are uh, dominant imaging, uh, dominant weighted images like T1, T2 and flare, and then there are modifiers. So in core brain, we perform T1, T2 flare, DWI with ADC map, DWI is diffusion weighted images with uh, ADC mapping. Um, we perform DWI images on the patient and the computer generates this ADC map from those uh, basic DWI sequences, then we perform the susceptibility weighted images. So I will, uh, 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 I will focus on uh, every single sequence one by one, uh, and I will lightly touch every one of them. Then there are the post contrast images. So how to recognize a sequence? You have already discussed in the previous lectures, you have to look at three to four structures. You have to look at the fat, uh, which you can find in the subcutaneous tissues. You have to look at a fluid containing structures in brain. These are ventricles in sp uh, spinal cord. This is the thecal sap, the CSF in the thecal sap or spinal canal. Then you have to look at the gray matter and white matter in the brain. And then you have to differentiate that whether it is a plain T1 weighted image or a post gadolinium T1 weighted images, then you look at the nasal mucosa. If it is enhancing, then it is a contrast uh, image. And if it is not enhancing, then it is a plain T1 weighted image. So there is a multitude of sequences and more and more sequences are uh, being added to this list as technologies advances, but still we make our decision on the basis of the core images. Uh, they are the basic images. So first of all, the T1 weighted images uh, already discussed in previous sessions. I have been attending those as well that you have to recognize few structures, which I already mentioned. You have to look at the subcutaneous fat, you have to look at CSF, and then you have to look at uh, gray matter and white matter. So always remember that T1 weighted images, basically they are for anatomy. So if they are for anatomy, we will look at them in the same way, the way the normal anatomy is. That is the gray matter is gray, the white matter is white, and the CSF is black. So when you uh, look at the peripheries of the brain parenchyma, which is gray matter, that is gray. If the center central part is white, uh, the, the tract containing part and the ventricles are black, then this is a T2, T1 weighted image. So then you have to decide that it, it, is there any fat suppression or not, because we require, some, at times we require fat suppression T1 weighted images. In certain situations, I will share the examples ahead. Uh, so you have to look at the subcutaneous fat or the scalp fat in this case as well. T1 weighted images are always useful for anatomical details, uh, for vascular changes, for disruption of blood brain barrier in post contrast images. So uh, we see and look at the anatomy on T1 always. In your books, you would have read when you would have been going through the chapters of uh, uh, brain tumors that most of the tumors behave in a way that they are hypo intense on T1 and they are, they are hyper intense on T2. But there are certain uh, things, few things which are hyper intense on T1. Mostly, most of the pathologies, they behave in a way that they are hypo intense on T1 because they are basically causing edema in the brain parenchyma. And whenever there is an uh, edema somewhere, there is increased water content. And we know that MRI is based on the precession of water molecules. So most of the brain tumors, they cause edema in the brain parenchyma. That is why they are hypo-intense on T1-weighted images and they are hyper-intense on T2-weighted images. There are only set of things which are hyper-intense on T1 and set of things which are hypo-intense on T2. You just have to memorize that. When you will know the list of those things, then you will be able to narrow down your differential in a very simple way. So I'll, I'm trying to make it simple so that it becomes a little bit palatable because this, there, are, there are so many complex physics and uh, things in the uh, MR and um, appearances. So I'll try to make it as simple as possible for you. As I already showed you that this fat in the scalp is hyper intense. So whenever there will be a fat containing lesion like a dermoid or a lipoma in the brain, that will return T1 weighted hyper intense signals. Unlike rest of the tumors, which are mostly T1 weighted hypo intense. Similarly, if there is melanin, because melanin uh, contain um, internal heavy uh, uh, ions, which, uh, which change the mechanics of the uh, you know, brain parenchyma. So melanin containing structures, they will be hyper intense due to uh, uh, their internal composition. Similarly, sluggish blood flow, calcium uh, or calcification and subacute blood, they are hyper intense. So there are few things which are physiologically hyper intense like fat and like sluggish flow and calcification. 
there are few pathological entities which are hyper intense on t1 like subacute blood and melanin so if you remember this list in your mind and you find then then you start focusing on the t1 weighted signals of any uh, tumor you are looking at for example you find a tumor which is in the ct angle and it contains t1 weighted hyper intense signals so you will keep in your mind that is it some kind of a uh, melanotic uh, meningioma or is this some kind of a lesion which has bleed inside it so then you will think in a out of box in a different way so uh, not only on this then uh, uh, the, on t1 you look at the internal structures there are certain other physiology uh, physics related parameters on the basis of which you can decide that whether it is a t1 weighted uh, image or a T2 weighted image. So if you look at this image, which I am showing you right here, there are certain uh, numbers written on the four corners of the image. So if you look at this image on the extreme right bottom corner, you can see that there are two things written, TE and TR. So these are the times to echo and time to resonate. This, this is related to the physics of the machine. So they are always uh, less than uh, seven to 800. TR is less than 800 in T1 weighted images and TE is less than 40 in T2. So, so, so this is also one of the confirmatory tests. At times when my technician brings images to me and he's saying that this is a flare image, but I am not convinced and I look at TR and TE and I decide that the uh, technician has performed the scan in a correct way he has applied the correct parameters or not so this is one of the things on the basis of which we decide that this is a t1 weighted image or a t2 weighted image uh, etc so i told you about the subcutaneous fat i told you about the gray matter and white matter i told you about the fluid signals and then there are the tr and te parameters written mentioned on the on your film or on your packs which uh, uh, further confirm that which sequence is that. So these are the T1 weighted fat set images. As I told you previously that the subcutaneous fat is bright on the plain T1 weighted images. These are T1 fat set images. They are ideally done in case of orbits because the orb intra coronal fat is already bright and we are unable to delineate between the pathology and the normal fat signals. So in that case, we perform fat set images. For example, in this image, you can see that this fat is uh, suppressed homogeneously but there is, there is some enhancing enhancement around the right optic nerve and this is an abnormal right optic nerve and if we would have not suppressed the fat these signals would have merged with the signals of the fat and uh, the delineation would not have been that uh, convenient or easy so fat set even weighted images in contrast especially they are performed uh, in almost all of the centers the, another example of fat suppression images this was a patient who presented to us uh, and there was an incidental finding of this T1 weighted bright uh, signal intensity area in the region of right tectal plate. And when, when we performed these fat set images, all of this suppressed and we were, you know, showed that this is a congenitally, con congenital uh, lesion and it is an incidental finding. It must not be causing some symptoms to, to the patient. So uh, then we come to the post contrast images and uh, we give gadolinium to the patients on T1 weighted images. So gadolinium is a contrast agent. There is certain toxicity to gadolinium, especially in patients who are uh, uh, having deranged renal function. Uh, the reliable sign to distinguish that it is a post-contrast image or a plain image is you have to look at the diesel turbinates. If they are enhancing, then uh, it means that this is a post-contrast image. There are the contrast in the cervical vessels and venous sinuses can be an unreliable indicator because we already discuss that sluggish flow uh, is going to uh, give you hyper uh, falsely hyper intense signals at times so that might give, might give you a wrong uh, impression so the reliable sign is that look at the enhancement of nasal turbinates if they are enhancing then this means that uh, it is a post contrast image for example in this uh, you can see that uh, this is uh, on the right side i have plain t1 weighted images and the, on the uh, on the left side I have uh, post gadolinium T1 weighted images. I can see the enhancement in the nasal turbinates and mucosa. And then this is, there is a cystic lesion in the right cerebellar hemisphere. Uh, its lateral aspect is indistinct on plain images and there is an enhancing nodule in this region. So uh, this is how the post gadolinium images help you uh, to further characterize a lesion. So always, always, always compare pre and post contrast images side by side because there are so many times when people are reporting, I've seen my radiology colleagues reporting 
in isolation and then they don't look at the plain T1 characteristics and they just write down that there is significant enhancement although the lesion had already been having some kind of hemorrhage and it was already bright on the plain T1 weighted images. Uh, so always, always compare the plain and post contrast images, try to compare them side by side. If you have films, place those films side by side so that you can, you know, make a better visual picture that there is enhancement or not. Um, we also perform T1 weighted sagittal images at times, for example, uh, for, for the midline structures, for example, the midline structures, the brainstem, the intratentorial structures, they are seen very well on um, uh, sagittal images. Um, specifically, we do this for the pituitary because uh, on uh, the plain T1, you can appreciate the difference between the anterior and posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary has a bright focus and uh, it, it is lying at its position. At times, specifically when um, referred by endocrinology colleagues, um, for example, this was a patient who presented to us. She was a 15 years old girl and she had um, all the symptoms of hyperpituitarism. And when we imaged the patient, we could see that the bright spot of posterior pituitary was ectopic in location. So there was pituitary transaction basically. I magnified this just to make it further clear that the posterior pituitary is lying at its normal position in this patient but it is lying at an ectopic position in uh, the patient who had all the symptoms of uh, pituitary uh, uh, pan uh, hypopituitarism. Similarly, the fat set images are helpful in cases of uh, fat containing lesions. For example, this was a lipoma of corpus callosum and uh, there was also some agenesis of corpus callosum and we can see that there is wide, wide separation of um, uh, frontal horns of bilateral lateral ventricles. They are lying parallel. And this uh, dermoid, it showed complete suppression on fat set images. When uh, actually this was reported as, uh, as something else because uh, the radiologist did not look at the T1 weighted plane images. He lost somehow some of the films and the scan was deleted from the system. So he reported it on T1 contrast. When the patient presented to us, we performed some fat set images and this was basically a lipoma of the corpus callosum. Um, fat set images are also important when you, we have to look at the uh, uh, trauma cases. For example, we are looking for dissection of vertebral artery or carotid artery. So when we perform fat set images, the skull based fat is suppressed and only the crescenteric uh, hyperintense hematoma it starts blooming or it starts becoming prominent on fat set T1 weighted images. So there are certain indications of performing fat set images. Uh, I'll not go into the detail of anatomy. Dr. Athar already shared it in a, a lot of detail with all the sulci and their uh, anatomical localization. Just to reinforce that again, that uh, uh, he focused already on the inverted omega sign. And there are certain other signs, for example, uh, this, the central sulcus has an omega sign. The pre-central sulcus is thicker than the post-central sulcus. The post-central sulcus is bifid. The intertrital sulcus reaches the post-central sulcus. So these are a few of the things on the basis, basis of which you make your anatomical localization that whether the pathology is lying or important for the marks. And then uh, it is important to, uh, to localize that where the pathology is actually lying. So this is the same, the uh, different areas of the brain, area six, area seven, this is all available on internet and books. I'll not go into the details of this. Uh, then we come to the T2 weighted images. We know that fat is relatively darker as compared to the T1 weighted images. We know that gray matter becomes white, white, white matter becomes gray and the fluid becomes bright. So it is all the uh, reverse of T1 weighted images. Whatever we saw on T1, uh, on T2, everything becomes reversed and the pathological edema it becomes very prominent. We look for the vascular flow voids on this. The bright edema is seen in most of the lesions. But still in these images, we cannot differentiate the edema from the uh, normal fluid. For, so for that reason... I, I, I agree. It's just that when you, when you have been doing something for so many years, you assume subconsciously that every, everybody knows these things but then it requires an extra effort to really go back to those things. It's yes, exactly. And especially for the beginners, it is very important because if you don't start from the scratch, they don't have a you know, good foundation. I don't, I think it becomes useless for them. They become confused only. So I just, you know, wanted to, because if you have MR ki basics, then to MR ko report karna is a piece of cake. It's not so difficult. बहुत लिमिटेड ट्रिकी केसेस होते हैं जिसमें हर कोई शायद फंसता है जब तक खुलता नहीं पेशेंट तब तक यू डोंट गेट टू नो व्हाट हैड बीन इनसाइड बट ये कि मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम्स इफ यू हैव अ गुड 
So it's basically a game of signals. So if you are picking up signals, you can you know easily easily get command over this. So I was just sharing that uh, you must have read in your books because when I was you know I started reading MR, I was always confused. Everything say said that whenever I was going through every tumor, hypointense on T1, suddenly it was hyperintense on T1. So I was all confused. Then I tried to you know dig the basics, and then I reached to this conclusion that there are only limited things. Which are hypo intense on T2, and only limited things which are hyper intense on T1. Other other things are following the same. Uh, what what we read in uh, Robin's pathology that there is edema whenever there is a lesion, and the edema is water, and water is hypo intense on T1 and hyper intense on T2. So there are only few lesions. So there are few lesions which are hypo intense on T2, and these are dense cells. Like for example, in Foma, there is dense cell packing. There are blood products. There are uh, flow voids in the uh, uh, in the sinuses and uh, vessels, and they, then the calcifications they can be hypo intense as well. So uh, always I I focus whenever I give a lecture I reinforce again and again that when you want to look at the patho look at the anatomy go for T1, uh, look you want to look at the pathology go for T2. So this is the essence of uh, you know these basic sequences. Always look at the anatomy on T1. If you lose your anatomy on T1, go back to your T2 and try to find the pathology there. So um, very important to look at the vessels on the T2 weighted images. This is, for example, this is basilar. This is internal carotid bilaterally. This is the superior sagittal sinus, posterior aspect and anterior aspect. And when you will uh, go to your venous sinus thrombosis and a stroke uh, section of your, you know, teachings. You will find out in so many patients that that on T2 you are able to pick up a venous sinus thrombosis or a superficial cortical venous thrombosis, or uh, a thrombus in an ICA or basilar artery or vertebral artery. So it is it if you start focusing on this in every patient, you do find pathologies here. And there, there are so many times you don't have to look even at the different rated images. You are so sure this is the superior sagittal sinus. So they all uh, you know they all appear as flow voids. On the T2 weighted images, so always keep in mind to look at these uh, whenever you are, you know, looking at the images. Then we come to the flare images. On the flare, it is uh, similar to a, we are doing T2 weighted flare in our centers most of the times. Only on few of the three Tesla scanners, a T1 flare is performed because T1 plane images they return a lot of artifacts. So most of the centers are performing T2 flare. So T2 flare is going to follow the gray and white matter signal, similar to T2 only. As the name says, says that it is a fluid attenuation in inversion recovery. So only fluid is attenuated. Rest it is a T2 weighted uh, image. The gray matter is white. The white matter is gray, and the fluid it becomes suppressed, attenuated. That is, it becomes dark. So the normal CSF is going to be attenuated. The pathological fluid will, you know, pop up. It will become very evident to look at the pathology. So it is basically delineation of lesions from ventricles and from Extra cerebral CSF spaces. For example, I have placed two images side by side, a T2 and a flare. So on T2, you can see that there is pathological edema and then there is the ventricle. But on flare, you can easily appreciate that the ventricle is only attenuated, compressed, uh, and by this uh, pathological edema. And the pathological edema and the signals from uh, ventricles they become easily demarcable. So uh, I tried to make this simple table and uh, I highlighted it uh, with the colors just to show you that. This is a T1 weighted image, right? So the gray matter, the white matter is white, the gray matter is gray, and the CSF is black, right? That is how the normal anatomical appearance is. The CSF becomes just like uh, uh, a T1 on flare, that is, it is black. So I highlighted both of these as yellow, and the gray and white matter structures of uh, signals of T2 and flare are the same. So this is just to simplify in a tabulated form. I find it easy to, you know, memorize in the form of tables. So. So just a revision that on what will be hyperintense on T1, what will be hypointense on T2, what will be uh, evident on flare. Uh, then there are further sequences like gradient, T2 star, or susceptibility weighted images. They are named as these three. Uh, it is written in books. In older books, it is written as T2 star, then it turned into gradient, and now a more sophisticated version of the same sequence, which is called susceptibility weighted sequence. So I just uh, placed them side by side to, you know, uh, give you a picture that the susceptibility weighted image is uh, superior. It picks up the hemorrhages in a better way. This is gradient image, right, of the same patient. This is susceptibility weighted images. So the hemorrhages, they become more evident. It is a more sophisticated sequence. It is an inbuilt mechanics of machine. It is available in all the 1.5 Tesla scanners. 
most of the scanners are still performing uh, who are following old books uh, they are still uh, performing t2 star or gradient but susceptibility is, uh, has the same it shows the same uh, pathology that is the hemorrhages they bloom out but it is a more sophisticated sequence um, susceptibility uh, there in in your scanner at AKU and in our scanners as well there is a summated susceptibility sequence as well which is going to summate the sequences and it is going to make uh, if, if you have gone on facts uh, through your images uh, you would have seen that there are two side by side susceptibility weighted images one and then there is an other one so basically the first one is summated it is a volume based uh, image and then they summate five mm sections together and the hemorrhages they further bloom out for example there are a few hemorrhages in this area and in the summated images they bloom further so it is just, uh, you know, machine built and it, it is uh, just another extra thing which is being offered by machines. So uh, then I will uh, move on to our uh, today's topic, which is uh, infratentorial lesion. And uh, before I go into detail, these are certain tables which are uh, giving the same. You can have the screenshot of this or this lecture is recorded. You can refer back to these. These are available on Internet as well, that what structures are dark, what are what are bright on T1 and T2 weighted images. Similarly, this is the, these are the same tables which are showing what will be hyper intense and hypo intense on T1 and T2 weighted images. And if you find these signals, what can be the differentials? So I will not go into the detail of this uh, because I've already discussed all of this. Um, I will go uh, next into the intratentorial masses. So the intratentorial masses, I think I am already because of light issues, it's 8.35, so till 8.45, I will finish uh, as much as I can, and then we can go back to uh, our interactive session if somebody has questions. So the intratentorial masses, they are basically divided into the masses which are in the fourth ventricle, the masses which are in the cerebellar hemispheres in the brainstem, and the CP angle masses. So um, whenever you are looking at masses, first of all, you have to look at the age of the patient because with age, the differentials, they change. Uh, most of the posterior fossa lesions in adults are metastasis, um, almost 50% of them according to literature. And in children, they have a different, different set of differentials. So always, always look at the age of the patient whenever you are starting with, you know, formulating a differential list in your mind. Um, first of all, I will focus on the fourth ventricular lesion. So I just uh, uh, shared a picture diagram to give you an idea that uh, where the lesion is going to lie and the differentials main differentials are medulloblastoma and ependymoma so i will just focus that uh, what are uh, how will we differentiate uh, these lesions so when we analyze a potential brain tumor there are many questions that need to be answered first of all as i already emphasized that you have to look at the age group then you have to localize that whether it is an intraaxial lesion or an extraaxial lesion which was already discussed in the previous session of um, uh, supratentorial tumors, but I will again, you know, give just an overview of the uh, intra and extra axial lesions. Uh, then you have to decide that whether it is lying in the midline, in the ventricle, in posterior fossa, uh, in brainstem, wherever it is. Then you have to, after, you know, uh, looking at these points in your list, because you have to make a checklist in your mind. It's a virtual checklist in your mind that you are looking at the age. First of all, you have to look that you are looking at the right patient. You have to, you know, match your technical parameters. Maybe at times the scans on the beds, they are, you know, everybody doesn't have a PAX and they don't open on system. There are so many centers in Pakistan in which people are working on films. So they just have to tell you that they are looking at the correct film. They have to match the name of the patient. Then they have to look at the age group. Then they have to, you know, localize that whether the lesion is in the in, intraaxial compartment, extraaxial compartment, intratentorial, supratentorial. Then they come, then there comes the MR characteristics. How is it appearing on T1? How is it looking like on T2? Is there any calcification? Is there any fatty component? Is there any cystic or hemorrhagic component? Then you come to next, after that, you compare your plain T1 with post contrast T1 weighted images. So I'm just giving you a systematic approach. How to approach an MR when you are getting it? Then you have to look at this that is it a solitary mass or there are multiple masses? You know, you have to, you know, scrutinize whole of the image that. Is it only one? Because if there is only one lesion, then the differential list will be different. If it if they, they are multifocal, then you will start thinking on different lines. Then you have to, you know, look at this that whether it is a pseudo tumor, like uh, last time Dr. Athar shared the case of that patient who had a large tumor effective multiple scler mul multiple sclerotic lesion. And that was, you know, labeled as tumor. The patient came to our hospital as well, that same patient, and then it was uh, that patient was referred to um, AKU. 
so we saw that uh, scan as well so they can be pseudo tumors so when whenever it comes to uh, posterior fossa tumors the most aggressive tumors which are seen in pediatric age group in posterior fossa are medulloblastoma so medulloblastoma are not only in the fourth ventricle they can be cerebellar and they can be you know in the peduncles as well so uh, there are four varieties basically of the medulloblastoma one of them is along the roof of fourth ventricle the most common one which we mostly encounter and in the differential of which we place ependymoma or atrt then there comes the cerebellar uh, kind of uh, uh, type of these medulloblastoma which are called sonic hedgehog and then there is this um, uh, type which is in the region of cerebellar peduncles which is the wnt or wingless type of uh, medulloblastoma so this is all the histopathology i'll just focus on the you know characteristic mr appearances but just for your you know uh, information i just wanted to share this uh, very beautiful picture from stat dx in which they have you know uh, very clearly shown all the four varieties uh, so i'll come first to the lesion which is lying in the fourth ventricle so uh, most of the times the patients present and they get a ct initially and then later on they are you know uh, advised mr by the uh, clinician so whenever you see a hyperdense lesion in the posterior fossa in the uh, fourth ventricle on ct always consider medulloblastoma if you are you are uh, catering with a certain age group especially from 3 to 10 years of age so uh, this was a patient who presented to us and there was a posterior fossa lesion which was uh, hypo or uh, hypo intense on t1 weighted images hyper intense on t2 weighted images it was compressing uh, the fourth ventricle uh you can see that it is uh, the posterior wall of the fourth ventricle cannot be easily delineated and we can see this tiny compressed part of fourth ventricle it is hyper intense on t2 and then it is showing intense on enhancement although it is not lying along the uh, roof of the um, fourth ventricle but this is not exclusive that it will always be in the roof it can most of the times it is along the roof but it can be you know at rest of the places as well so it was showing uh, diffusion restriction and it was uh, you know partly low on adc map and this was uh, about this this was uh, proved to be a case of medulloblastoma but when you are looking or suspecting a patient with medulloblastoma we know that medulloblastoma have drop metastases and then we have to you know image the entire neuroaxis and the spine of this patient was uh, uh, imaged and we could appreciate multiple enhancing lesion of, uh, along the cord and nerve roots etc so similarly this was an other case and in this patient there was again a fourth ventricular lesion which was aggressive which was showing diffusion restriction which was uh, causing compression and defacement of the fourth ventricle and there was a proximal hydro in, in these patients there is mostly proximal hydrocephalus and the patients most of the times they present with signs of raised icp so this was a case of medulloblastoma as well so whenever a case of medulloblastoma comes what differentials should come to your mind are at rt that is atypical rhabdoid teratoid tumors but remember that atypical rhabdoid teratoid tumors they present in a younger age group they present under 3 years of age uh, and they are also very aggressive then you think about ependymoma and in ependymoma is a grade 2 uh, tumor and uh, but still in ependymoma you have to you know image the entire neuroaxis and you have to exclude certain syndromes as well then we have when, whenever there are cerebellar type of medulloblastoma you will consider pilocytic astrocytoma whenever it is intraventricular this gross hydrocephalus and it is an intensely enhancing vision you will consider choroid plexus papilloma as well so uh, this was a case of atrt this was a 2 and 1/2 years old child and in, in in that patient we found a heterogeneous large mass with cystic component so it is these are huge masses they have cystic component they have bleed in them they have solid enhancing component and they are under 3 years of age so in that case you have to consider atrt as well the ependymomas they also fill the fourth ventricle but try to find that these lesions they these are called plastic lesions so they grow along the ependymal lining so you have to focus on foramen of lishka and foramen of mejendi that are they growing along the ependymal lining so in this patient for example we can see that part of the lesion is protruding through the through the midline foramen and part of it is protruding or growing through the lateral foramen so this is an ependymoma so an ependymoma also present with raised icc symptoms and they are plastic lesions they are growing along the ependymal lining and then again you have to you know image all the ependymal lining uh, areas to uh, look at the uh, the the other lesions of ependymoma so uh, the difference between ependymoma versus medullo is that medullo is an aggressive lesion it's a great four lesion and medullo does not grow along the uh, foramen but it has metastases 
through CSF ceiling. So in this case, you can see that there is, you, you know, chalky white lining of the meninges if you focus throughout and then the cerebellar folia are enhancing too much and this is not smooth enhancement. It is nodular type of enhancement. So this gives us a picture that this is an aggressive lesion which is having metastasis uh, through CSF as well. But this is a lesion which is protruding through the midline foramina. And it is uh, basically uh, growing through the ependymal linings. So it is an, an ependymoma. And ependymoma on CT is relatively hypodense as compared to medulloblastoma. So then we come to the next lesion, which is in the cerebellum, which is a pilocytic astrocytoma. They are basically cystic lesions and they have an enhancing uh, nodule. Uh, they are lying in the cerebellar hemispheres. They are, they are in the same uh, age group. Uh, Another lesion which is very important in the posterior fossa or intratentorial location are the brainstem gliomas. And uh, brainstem gliomas, basically, they, they are uh, mostly in the region of pons. Uh, their main differentials are uh, pontine myelinolysis. And in that case, you have you know, a history of uh, sodium correction. There can be, in elder patients, there can be pontine infarcts. There can be pontine ischemic changes, and they are misreported as Pontine gliomas. Recently, we had a, you know, a, a, a CEO from a hospital from Islamabad who presented to us with T2 hyper, T2 inferior hyperintense signals in the uh, pons, but there were ischemic changes in the brain as well. He was 42, 43 in age, but he was a smoker. He, he was a smoker for, you know, he had a history of 30 to 40 pack years. And uh, he had ischemic changes. He had uh, coronary uh, bypass uh, grafting some two years back because of coronary. Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, he, because of smoking, he had advanced atherosclerotic disease. So he was being labeled as a case of pontine uh, glioma by so many people. And uh, he was offered uh, radiation at one of the hospitals in Lahore. So then he presented to us and probably then he later visited AKU as well, etc. So pontine gliomas, there will be increase in the bulk of pons. So whenever you see an increase in the size of that particular structure, you have to consider that there is something which is infiltrating that area, which is replacing the normal cells. It can be either an abscess in the pons, it can be TB in the tuberculous abscess in the pons, or it can be pontine glioma. Then you will you know, focus on the T1 characteristics and T2 and post contrast. And then you will uh, look at the diffusion weighted images and then rest of the images, they uh, you know, play a role. At times, people uh, perform MR spectroscopy. Our neurosurgery department is very fond of performing uh, spectroscopy. Uh, but uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we don't get you know, very different results from the baseline images. Most of the time, what we are suspecting from the baseline images, uh, the spectro is you know, giving the same picture. Uh, but in tumors, uh, just to give an overview that there will be in, in normal glial tissue, I have placed a, a normal control voxel and a lesion voxel. So in normal control voxel, you can see that uh, NAA has the highest peak and choline and creatine ha have lower peaks and there is no lipid lactate uh, doublet. But when there is a lesion, there, the choline peak will be raised and NAA will be decreased. And due to internal areas of necrosis, if there are any, there will be lipid lactate doublet. So um, people are, uh, especially uh, I've seen that neurosurgeons, they find it very helpful. Probably their literature supports that. Uh, there are pineal tumors as well in the intratentorial tumors. For pineal tumors, you have to, you know, the sagittal images are very good, but even if you're looking at the axial images, you have to trace the splenium of corpus callosum. So whenever a lesion is lying below the splenium of corpus callosum and above the tectal plate, like a small space between the splenium of corpus callosum, the cerebellar hemisphere, its superior aspect and the tectal plate, any lesion lying in this area is supposed to be a pineal lesion until proven otherwise. So uh, if you localize a lesion correctly, your anatomy is strong, then you know you can reach the differentials very easily. So it is very important to you know, uh, diagnose lesions in uh, children uh, at an early time because they require a long uh, set of treatment and they lose so many days of their um, happiness.